Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the special public lecture by James Bridle, Ways of Thinking, Ways of Being. My name is Yuko Hasegawa, Professor of the Graduate School of Global Arts, Tokyo University of the Arts, and I will be your moderator today. This lecture is part of the Introduction to Arts and Culture in the Age of Globalization course offered by the Graduate School of Global Arts, which welcomes various researchers and artists active around the world. Today's guest, Jane Bridle, is widely active as an artist, writer, and technologist. James holds a master's degree in computer science and cognitive science from University College London, where James wrote their thesis on the creative applications of artificial intelligence. As an artist, they have worked on a wide variety of artworks, which have been exhibited in museums and galleries as well as online, and have been honored by Ars Electronica and the Japan Media Arts Festival. They are also an active writer, and their texts on literature, cultural networks have appeared in magazines and newspapers and around the world. And James formulated the research project on the new aesthetics, which has gained um, a lot of attention worldwide. James' writing has appeared in magazines and newspapers, including Wired, The Atlantic, The New Statements, The Statesman, The Guardian, and The Observer. In 2018, James published New Dark Age, a book on technology, politics, and society, which has been translated into a variety of languages, including Japanese. And James' new book, Ways of Being, which is connected to the theme of today's lecture, will be um, published this spring in 2022. And in this talk, James will talk about the artificial intelligence, non-human intelligence, technology, ecology, modern human relationships, and how we can become one with the world again. With that, um, I would like to welcome James. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for that invitation. Uh, thank you um, uh, for that introduction, my apologies. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, thank you to the audience for, for listening. I hope this is of interest. Um, as you've just heard, I'm a, I'm a writer and an artist, uh, but mostly I just think about things and try and work out uh, what I find to be interesting about them. And then I like to share what I find is interesting about them. And uh, one of the results of that is a new book that's coming out soon called Ways of Being. And uh, this lecture will be uh, a little bit of the ideas that have gone into that book. Um, yeah, and I'll just start straight off. But let's, uh, let's show some pictures to go along with it. So yes, I titled this talk Ways of Thinking, Ways of Being. Uh, just to, um, to pick up on like a couple of the ideas within the book, which goes to quite a few different places. But I'm going to concentrate on, on some ideas around thinking and intelligence today. Um, but I want to start here. Um, a few years ago, I moved to Greece, uh, to the uh, first Athens, the capital of Greece, and subsequently to a small island um, uh, just off the coast of Athens, uh, where I live now. Um, and I've been exploring the country for a few years, and it's a, it's a really beautiful and wonderful country that I've been getting to know. And uh, about three years ago now, I first went to the region called Ipirus, uh, which is right up in the north of the country, uh, close up against the, the um, border with Albania. Uh, it's quite a mountainous, rugged, region quite heavily forested uh it's not very built up um it's mostly still small villages uh it's incredibly beautiful it's one of the most beautiful places i've ever been in my life and i fell instantly in love with it and i was lucky enough to meet some people who sort of showed me around um 
but um, but unfortunately, I also wasn't there for, for, for a very good reason, as I'll explain. Uh, I was immediately besotted by this place, but um, uh, as I was wandering around, I kept coming across things like this. This was literally in the, as I wandered kind of in these forests, you can see around this lake. I kept coming across things like this. This is a, a it was a wooden stake driven into the ground, kind of marked with, with, an ID number and some sort of spray paint that's been put on it and all the plants around. And as I was walking through the woods, I, I came to came across more and more of these. They actually seemed to kind of stretch through the woods in lines. There was kind of plastic tape and there was bits of wood. Um, and um, what I what I slowly came to realize is that these were the marks of an artificial intelligence. These were the marks of uh, a vast computational power um, that was coming down to meet this landscape. These were the kind of tooth and claw marks of, of an artificial intelligence at exactly the point where it met the Earth. And I'll, I'll explain a bit more about what I mean by that, but I need to, I'm sorry, grab a clock one quickly. Uh, Sorry, just want to know uh, what time it is. So I know not to talk about too long. Um, so what do I mean by this being a, the tooth and claw marks of an artificial intelligence? Well, it turned out that um, over the last decade or so, uh, the Greek government has sold off huge parts of uh, Epirus, the region that I was just in, uh, the Ionian Sea, uh, other parts of Greece for oil and gas exploration. So it's believed that there's large quantities of oil and gas underneath the ground in this region and off the coast and in other parts of Greece to, um, to a number of large uh, corporations to explore this, uh, explore for oil and gas in these areas. And it turns out that one of the ways that they're doing this is that they're using artificial intelligence. In fact, the oil and gas industry is one of the biggest kind of customers for the latest technology of all kinds, but particularly of something like artificial intelligence. Because as, as, um, uh, as climate change begins to bite, um, and also as we start to run out of oil and gas, because we've also pumped most of it up already, um, what remains in the ground is becoming extremely valuable. Uh, and so a lot of oil and gas companies are either trying to find new reserves or they're re-examining old places which weren't previously considered economical to exploit. And artificial intelligence helps with both those things. Uh, through kind of large-scale data analysis, um, it's possible both to, you know, to locate and evaluate uh, new resources for oil and gas and to figure out how to exploit them more efficiently, more cheaply, for more profit. And, and it, to do this, so the, the company working in Greece is called Repsol. It's one of the largest oil companies in the world. It was based in Spain, but it's gone global. And it's had longstanding partnerships with Google and with IBM and others to buy their artificial intelligence um, software in order to better uh, extract and use uh, the oil and gas products. And as I say, I, I, I kind of was coming across this series of realizations while walking through this forest in northern Greece. And it shook me to my core. Um, because we all know where this is heading. We all know what this means. Um, burning, extracting, and burning the very last oil and gas that, li that still lies under the earth will doom us all. Um, and not just us, but every being we share the planet with, uh, to continue to burn oil and gas right now is to make the future of this planet completely unlivable for us and for millions and millions of other beings. It's literally insane to do it. And yet, this is what we're tuning artificial intelligence to do. This thing that is supposedly the kind of cutting edge of our science and technology and thinking we're training it to extract the oil and gas to kill us. Uh, that's not 
that's not intelligence. That's not any intelligence that I recognize. That's stupid. That's the, the most stupid thing we can be doing. So <laughs> what's going on here when the thing that we call artificial intelligence is doing uh, for vast profit the most stupid thing we could be doing in the present. Something seems to me to be deeply amiss. Uh, th there's other signs that, that this is amiss as, as well. Um, it's worth noting that um, uh, artificial intelligence requires vast, vast amounts of data, is even more complicit in climate change directly than, than other forms of computation. Um, the internet, for example, um, already has a similar carbon footprint to the entire global aviation system. Um, like computers are as bad for the planet as planes are. Um, and artificial intelligence is particularly bad because it requires so many processes, so much data, such intensive use, it literally makes the computers hotter, uh, which is incredibly, incredibly bad for the planet and requires more fuel and more cooling and so on and so forth. Um, so, so AI is, is, seems, if you consider it not through the lens of, of small corporate profit, but at this kind of larger scale, to be, to be an incredibly dangerous thing to all of us. And, and it strikes me that it's also um, cognitively or, or, or socially and, and, and interpersonally a strange thing that we're setting out on as well, because the, the, the other main hallmark of AI that we seem to be excited about is the way in which it beats us at games. Uh, the, the whole model of artificial intelligence is presently conceived is largely oppositional. From the reason it keeps a picture now of the defeat of um, uh, the Go master, Lisa Doll, by AlphaGo, Google's piece of software that developed to beat humans, is because Training it against us, or even against other models, is the way we think intelligence improves. Uh, we think that's how to make something smart, by making it beat us or other things. And I've been thinking for some time that there's something fundamentally wrong about that idea um, that we need to address and change in the very near future, um, before we are left alone on a on a damaged, if not if not mortally wounded planet, um, no longer even the smartest thing around, being surpassed by this technology that we trained to beat us at everything that we thought was fun. Something seems so deeply deep time trying to think of think of other options. Um, and this doesn't come out of nowhere. I've spent the last decade thinking about technology. Um, uh, this, is, this has been focused you know, a lot on the kind of public internet, on social media, uh, on the, the everyday algorithms we encounter that shape our lives in ways that we're not even aware of. For a long time, I've, I've, I've been aware that the way we, we think about computers, the way we think about what we think computers should do and their role in the world, is it also massively flawed and leads to all kinds of inequalities and, and violence in the world. And so, as I've been trying to rethink the nature of computers and the nature of technology increasingly, it's, it's come down to these questions of intelligence as well. Like, what do we think intelligence is for? What do we think our role in the world is with machines that are becoming increasingly autonomous and these are interesting and fun questions and i'm going to talk a little bit about the places that they've taken me the first the first thing that starts to happen when you start to ask what intelligence is is that you realize that there's no good answer there's no answer that anyone's ever really totally agreed on and really the only the only solid definition that's um, survived, really, for very long is intelligence is what humans do. And historically, only what some humans do, only what civilized 
most humans do or only what men do or a number of other kind of subcategories within that. Um, but, uh, but, but what humans do tends to be our kind of defining definition of intelligence. Which means when we try and see who else around us might be intelligent, we tend to miss what's actually going on. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that, because we've spent, we've spent the last several hundred years, uh, certainly, certainly the last couple of hundred years scientifically, with modern scientific methods, trying to decide how intelligent non-human animals Hello, are, for example. Hello, excuse me, James. Um, Sorry, if I can intervene you. Sorry, this is Yuko speaking. James, can you hear me? This, as I say, is we tend to Good view it all through the James. lens of our own Good intelligence. Um, so, for example... Um, James, sorry, your connection seems to be breaking up. Tests might look like this, which is uh, where... Uh, I'm kind of... um, Hello? Yes? James, uh, sorry, and the connection uh, is breaking up. Yes, uh, could you Hello. kindly and, uh, reconnect? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry, James' connection is um, choppy at the moment, so I've asked James to log off and reconnect. Oh. I'm very sorry. sorry, is that better? Ah, okay. Yes, you come back. Okay. Yes, could you, better? Could you start? Please start? Yes. Thank you. Please. Thank you, and sorry about that. Um, so I, um, so, so we, we, we designed these experiments to sort of test the intelligence of other beings. And a good example of this is a kind of tool test where an animal is given a stick and a small piece of food is placed outside their cage. And if they can somehow use this stick to, um, to get at the food, then we'll say, well, they, that's, that seems like something intelligent. We'll kind of give them credit for that. Um, but quickly, problems start to arise. And, and a, a famous problem with this was the problem of bonobos, uh, which are a, a very smart-seeming ape in all kinds of other ways. Um, but they seem to have real trouble with this task. Uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, um, and, and another, a number of smaller monkeys all did this test really happily. Um, and so by the scientific test, they were intelligent. But bonobos just refused. They didn't use the stick. They wouldn't play with the tools. They did nothing. Until one day, um, uh, not, not until only about a decade ago, someone redesigned the experiment. And instead of putting the stick on the ground, uh, they hung the stick from the ceiling. Um, and immediately, the bonobo grabbed the stick, foot, grabbed the food, stuck it in his mouth. And in that moment, sort of magically, the bonobo becomes intelligent, right? Because it passes this magic test, which is rubbish, of course. The bonobo has always been intelligent. Uh, the, the stupidity was kind of on our part um, because we failed to see uh, the whole of this being. We failed to understand, for example, that um, bonobos are brachiators, uh, which means they live in the trees, which means they have a view of the world that's shaped entirely differently to those of us who live on the ground. Right? They perceive the world in a radically different way. And so they see potential tools in different ways. What's, what's different isn't their, their intelligence necessarily, just their way of seeing the world. And, and crucially, the, the failure to recognize their intelligence was ours, not theirs. 
uh, the, 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 it's entirely about our own um, lack of intelligence and lack of imagination that blinded us to the intelligence of other beings. And there's many, many examples of this kind of thing happening. Uh, another another way in which in a certain quality like intelligence is often measured is a thing called the mirror test, where animals are given um, are presented with a mirror, and certain tests are done to see if they if they are seeing themselves. I a small dot might be painted on their forehead, and if they sort of rub that, then you understand that they see themselves in the mirror, and that implies a certain kind of self awareness. Um, but again. This, this test seems to fail across all kinds of different animals. For example, animals that don't like to make eye contact because eye contact is a, is a hostile gesture typically fail the mirror test. So gorillas typically fail the mirror test, for example. Um, and in fact, it's recently been discovered that um, uh, humans across many different cultures pass and fail the mirror test in different ways. And in fact, all of our intelligence tests when properly subjected to scrutiny, fail uh, or at least operate differently in different cultures. So, so intelligence varies widely across human cultures just as much as it does between species. But I, I love these examples of where we've been, you know, too blind or, or, or where, the, where the, the methodology of our science doesn't allow us to account for this intelligence of other beings. Um, for example, there's a, a famously... Uh, Indian elephants uh, have passed the mirror test. Uh, they've, they've put large mirrors in front, of, in front of Indian elephants. They've touched sort of marks on their heads or whatever the, the arrangement is to show that they're intelligent. Whereas African elephants are not yet scientifically intelligent because no one's been able to build a mirror that's large enough and strong enough to withstand uh, their inquisitiveness when first presented with one of these, they simply destroy the mirrors. Um, so once again, it's, it's just a very visible way in which our own kind of failings and weaknesses to perceive the intelligences of others are kind of the, the highlight or, or low light of our relationship. And there's so many strange forms of intelligence when you start to look at the world in these ways. Um, uh, the octopus has in recent years become a kind of poster animal for, for a different form of intelligence. Um, uh, something that scientists call almost kind of akin to, the, to an alien upon the earth because this creature is, is so physically uh, different to us and yet shows kind of really quite extraordinary intelligence under different circumstances. Um, octopuses are famous for their ability to escape from zoos, for example. Um, uh, they're also known, you know, in um, in laboratories for for their sort of playful or inquisitive behaviour. Um, there's tales of octopuses which learn to squirt wa water at light bulbs to turn the lights off, uh, and they're known to be able to recognise individual humans. Uh, they, they they can recognise human faces and treat people differently, and um, and they're also physically intriguing, extraordinary. Um, more than half of the octopus's neurons, the stuff that makes up brains, is actually distributed throughout their body. Um, so that their, their whole brain actually permeates the body. And it seems, it seems, it appears that their arms operate effectively as, as their own separate individuals. So at least the whole body operates um, uh, semi-independently, um, or is a kind of con a loose confederation of multiple brains rather than the kind of top-down control system that exists in the human. One of the most striking features of the octopus is its eye. Um, and it's a particularly fascinating organ because it's very, very similar to the human. Uh, it's a, a kind of little liquid-filled sac with an iris and a pupil. Um, in fact, it's slightly better than the human eye um, because the uh, optic nerve grows around the back rather than into it meaning octopuses don't have the blind spot that human eyes have. Um, and so it's a very similar to our eye, but it evolved entirely independently. Uh, if you go back about 400 million years, uh, you will find the, the last common ancestor of humans and uh, octopuses. And that was probably some kind of blind worm swimming at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and, and for 400 million years, 
uh, down the evolutionary tree, 400 million years back up the other side. That's how far away from the octopus, how separate our evolutions have been in completely different circumstances. And yet we both possess this incredibly similar eye, um, a kind of what's known as parallel evolution in work. And so the question becomes, if the eye can evolve twice, differently, but along similar lines, then why not intelligent? And if not twice, why not many times? The why not? Why should this, the historic view of the world uh, that we have, that that uh, that both stands for kind of physiognomy, the shapes of animals, but also also for their abilities and their intelligences, this tree that always has us at the top and everything down below, start to realize that this isn't, you know, what what the world looks like at all. It's it's not what our our neighbors on this planet look like at all, that the tree of life is is less like a tree and more like a, a bush um, or, or, or potentially a cloud uh, with intelligence flowering all over the place in many different ways and in many different forms. And when you start to, to understand that, you understand not just the many different extraordinary ways in which the world can be understood and the way in which the world can communicate, but the things we can really learn from it as well. Uh, in recent decades, alongside new scholarship on animal cognition, animal intelligence, we're starting to learn a lot more about plants and other creatures as well. Um, and the research in the last 20 years has shown that beneath the forest floor, there exist these extraordinary communication networks uh, formed by fungi and plants interweaving their roots. Uh, not just communication networks. These are uh, these are networks that share nutrients. Plants of different species send each other food during hard times through these networks. They also communicate through them. If one tree on one side of the forest is attacked by insects, they can send a signal through these underground channels um, to another tree on the other side of the forest, which will start to produce chemical defenses before the insects even arrive. There's a whole world of, of communication, information, and resource sharing going on under our feet all the time that we're only just beginning to recognize. And that's a huge subject. Um, but the thing that fascinates me about it, um, or one of the things that fascinates me about it, is the fact that um, we only recognize this network, that it has existed beneath our feet the entire time we've been on this planet, we only started to recognize it when we started to make networks of our own. Um, this is a, an image made of the internet about a decade ago, a kind of mapping of the internet. And the internet and, and these plant networks, they're not the same thing. But what they do do is they share certain properties, mathematical properties of, of topology and topography, the shape and layout of these networks. And quite early on in the development of the internet, it was realized that it didn't obey the mathematical laws of networks that existed up to that point. And so actually the internet gave birth to a whole new mathematical field um, of network theory that, that, was, that arrived in order to understand how a network like this functioned, that you could have a network that was well distributed where some nodes had many connections and some nodes had few, fewer connections. And yet um, uh, it could grow to an infinite size uh, and continue to function. And that those properties were discovered only because we built the internet. And it was only because we built the internet that we then could look under the ground and see this, these connections of fungi and trees as what they were as information and sharing networks. So it seems perhaps that one of the things that's quite common to us, us humans as a species, is we kind of need to make our own version of something that already exists in nature in order to, um, in order to see the thing that's been in front of us all this time, uh, that we need to make almost a kind of toy version of the wonder of nature uh, in order to in order to create our, our own mental model of it, um, I tend to think that these mental models or metaphors for things are are incredibly important. Um, 
because we really we really struggle to to see and recognize things in the world unless we carry some kind of mental model of what they might be and so in this case we needed the mental model of networks given us by the internet in order to see the the networks that already existed uh, under the earth and likewise it's my growing suspicion that artificial intelligence if we choose not to use it to extract all of the oil and gas from under the ground and thereby destroy ourselves. If instead we actually see artificial intelligence as another of these methods or mental models uh, to recognize it as another form of intelligence that allows us to see all the other intelligences that have surrounded us this whole time. The fact that, that actually artificial intelligence is a kind of doorway that says, hey, human intelligence is not the only game in town. There are many, many forms of intelligence, many ways of doing intelligence, many which have preceded us and have surrounded us this whole time and we've ignored them. But now you see, now we have AI and if, if there's human intelligence and artificial intelligence, like the octopus eye and the human eye, if two, then many, many more. There's all kinds of places to find interesting connections along these lines between intelligence, technology, uh, and, and the natural world and the non-human world. One of my favorite examples of these is um, some very weird critters called slime molds. Slime molds are, um, well, no one's really sure what they are, in fact. Uh, they used to think they were fungi, but they don't appear to be fungi. Uh, and they're not algae either, but they look sort of like this and like many other things. Um, and they also, they don't, we don't really know whether they're individuals or groups or collectives. Sometimes they function as single-celled organisms like amoebae. Um, and sometimes they group together into kind of huge globular sacs. Um, but they have a number of very extraordinary properties. Uh, so a few years ago, um, some scientists in Japan set out to examine what was seen as the, the, the root finding properties of uh, slime molds. So it was known that if you place them on a piece of glass and put some food nearby, they would find very efficiently the, the fastest way to get to that food. In this experiment, the researchers set the slime mold uh, the task of uh, designing a rail network for the Tokyo metro area. And what they did was they placed the slime mold on the slide um, and they placed small pieces of food in the places of kind of large metro areas, places where there would be major stations. And also um, they made it, they didn't make it easy as well. They, um, slime molds dislike bright lights. And so they shone lights on the places where there were rivers or mountains, places where it would be difficult to make a, a rail connection. And it took 24 hours, as you see in these series of pictures, for the slime mold to recreate um, an incredibly complex routing network uh, that's obviously taken uh, human engineers in you know, a couple of centuries to evolve. Uh, the slime mold uh, figured out the most efficient way of doing a routing like this very quickly, which is a cool trick, let's say. Um, but it's not the only one that the slime mold has up its sleeve. Um, there's another type of problem uh, in mathematics and computer science called the traveling salesman problem that's similar but different. The traveling salesman problem says, you have to visit six cities. What is the uh, fastest way to go to each city once and return home? It's harder than it sounds. It's not impossible, but it's, it actually takes quite a long time to figure that out, even if you're a computer. Uh, and the reason it takes a long time is that uh, uh, there are quite a lot of possibilities uh, for six cities. There's actually six times five times four times three times two times one possibilities. Um, and so it takes a while to figure out. But problems like this are really nasty because as, if you've understood that sequence of mathematics, 
you understand that adding one more city makes it seven times harder again, eight times harder, nine times harder. And the graph of trying to solve that problem and how difficult it is, the graph goes like this up into a straight line. It's what's called an exponentially hard problem. It gets fiendishly hard very, very quickly. And problems like this are computers hate, are very, very, very bad at. Um, because because of the number of possibilities multiplying so fast, a computer quickly is unable to finish the problem. And famously, the traveling salesman problem is a problem like this. There's, there is, it's almost impossible for computers to solve any large number. But what researchers discovered uh, by putting um, slime molds into petri dishes, as you see here, connecting them to various points, and again, using light to block up various connections. They discovered that the um, slime molds, this weird single-celled organism, can solve the traveling salesman problem in linear time. I, it doesn't get exponentially harder. The line, the graph stays a flat line, and every time you add the city, it just takes it slightly longer, but not too much. And this is extraordinary. Humans can't do this. Uh, and the fastest supercomputers cannot do this, but this strange little organism can. And there remains, it seems to be, not just in the kind of creative intelligence that we like to think about as defining intelligence, but in things like mathematics and computation as well, entirely different ways of thinking about the world that are embodied in different beings that we're only just beginning to discover. And I bring up examples of, uh, like this because I'm fascinated by the way in which our ways of thinking become so stuck over time in particular forms. And computation is a really, really good example of this. This is the, this is the diagram representing the computer that was invented by Alan Turing in 1936, what's called the universal machine or the Turing machine. And the thing about the Turing machine is it's incredibly simple. It's just uh, a piece of tape with a read-write head, like an old video recorder, right? And it just writes symbols to a tape and, and erases them and replaces them and does some calculation. And, and Turing's invention, so simple, and yet it is still how almost every single computer ever built works. Um, we've made them faster. We've made them um, slightly more complex in certain ways, but this is almost all computers. Uh, it's the computer that I'm using now. It's the computer you're using now. It's the computer that flies planes or the computers in banks. They're all this kind of computer. And yet, this is only a tiny fraction of what computers could be. Computers can be all kinds of other things. And in fact, in a paper written shortly after the invention of the computer, Turing uh, mentioned something else. He called that computer the automatic machine. But then he said there was another kind of machine possible, an oracle machine. And he doesn't say anything about it apart from saying this, whatever it is, it cannot be a machine. That was in 1950. And we spent 70 years since then building automatic machines, uh, the kind of machines that just go step by step through processes and have come, as I say, to kind of define our thinking about the world. And yet at the same time, from the very beginning, from Alan Turing in 1950, this other kind of machine has been possible. Whatever could it be? Well, some people who tried to answer that question, um, well, the group of people who are now known as cyberneticians, the people who worked in cybernetics, cybernetics was a, a weird discipline and remains one. But its most important quality is that it didn't really care about definitions of intelligence. It didn't say, hey, we need to figure out what intelligence is and then do that. It believed in behavior. It believed in um, uh, simply kind of placing things into the world and seeing how they behaved and reacted and working with uh, the emergence of certain patterns or um, ways of understanding the world, much as we might do if we took the thinking of the octopus or the slime mold 
a little bit more seriously. This strange image I'm showing you now is a diagram of a, of a factory, believe it or not, designed by the English cybernetician Stafford Beer in 1959. And the reason for this was that in the 1950s, large companies started to bring in automation. They really believed that um, you know, the future of, of industry, of factories, was going to be, uh, was going to be automated. Um, and, and they understood that this would mean basically putting computers on everything and getting commuters to do all of the work. And to be fair, that's mostly what's happened. But Beer and others thought something else. They thought that, um, that just replacing people with computers wouldn't work because as soon as the systems around them change, um, then the, the, the computers would fail. They wouldn't be able to adapt and the company would, would go bankrupt. Instead, they sought to design systems that were more like brains, that were adaptive to the world around them, that changed based on circumstances. And this is an attempt to do that. This is a diagram, very hard to read, I know, uh, that describes all of the things going into and out of a factory, all the things it's connected to, uh, and all, essentially all the inputs and outputs to a system. And at the middle, in the bottom, you have this thing that was a brain. But what would the brain be? This was kind of Beer's great question. And he did, a number, he did huge numbers of experiments trying to figure out kind of what you could place inside there. Uh, he tried to teach, uh, he taught children uh, very complex mathematics, for example. He taught them how to do um, uh, simultaneous equations to show that it was possible to teach uh, novices or what he called simple minds, complex ideas. Um, he made whole large mechanisms with rats and mice running inside them, literally pulled along by pieces of cheese uh, that would uh, react in different ways to various stimuli. And in my favorite example, uh, at some point in the 1950s, he installed a large tank of water in the basement of his house and he filled it with various kind of small microorganisms from, that he gathered in buckets from ponds around his house. Um, and his idea was that if he could study the interaction of these, these animals well enough, he could integrate them with the factory in some way. So, for example, he took little creatures called Daphnia, who are very sensitive to light, and he hung lamps over the tank and he switched them on and off according to various variables associated with the factory. And then the ways in which the Daphnia moved to and fro amongst these lights was then fed back into the factory system again in order to control it. Uh, he also um, took another little creature called Hydra, and he fed them uh, iron filings so that they became magnetized. And again, he used magnets to kind of move them around and wait until they achieved some kind of organization that was then fed back into the factory again. And he believed that it might be possible to set up a kind of system of feedback between automated systems and living systems that would allow them to come into a kind of equilibrium, into a harmony and balance. And when that balance was disturbed by changing outside conditions, um, it would adapt because that's what ecosystems do. You recognize that particularly communities of beings whether a tank full of hydra or a, a stack of cytoplasm like the slime mold, that what organisms, what living beings do, what the world does, is to adapt to changing conditions. And so this was his answer to Turing's question of what is an oracle machine. An oracle machine is a machine that is connected to the world in a meaningful way through understanding and living with other living beings by harnessing the great kind of extraordinary power and intelligence ecosystems to be able to uh, address and help out our technological system. There's a whole field of really extraordinary uh, ideas around this. Um, uh, in, in the years following Beer, that have explored all the other types of kind of strange computers that you can build that to me are interesting because they are closer to the world in ways that allow us to think about things that, that, that simple uh, binary and aggressive computation doesn't allow us to do. This field sometimes known as kind of um, unorthodox computing 
uh, and you'll see why. Because one of the things it likes to do is to attempt to build computers out of all sorts of things. For example, out of billiard balls. Um, imagine for a moment uh, a, a billiard table uh, with two chutes or slides going down into it and two pockets at the other end. If you drop a ball into one chute, it will roll down and go into the pocket at the other side. If you drop a ball into this chute, it will roll down and go into the um, uh, shoot at the other end. But if you drop two balls at once, they will knock into each other and neither will go into the pockets. And that's called a NOR gate. That's a type of logical gate that's at the heart of all kinds of computers. All computers are built out of a system of deciding if ones and zeros produce other ones and zeros. These are, these are called OR and NOT and NAND gates. They're simple pieces of mathematics that are performed usually with electrons, but can in fact be performed with billiard balls, or in fact, anything else at all, like crabs. These are Japanese soldier crabs. They're found in, in huge numbers in the lagoons of Japan. Um, and they are known, you might know this, for swarming at mating time in huge numbers. Uh, they gather together into kind of vast rolling swarms uh, that can contain thousands of individuals, uh, but also actually quite predictable. They tend to move in a quite direct line, and if two of them smash into each other, you can predict where they're going to go. You might be able to figure out where they, I'm going with this, though what you're imagining might be quite terrifying. You can, of course, build a computer out of crabs in exactly the same way uh, that you can build a um, computer out of billiard balls uh, by simply uh, making the crabs move through particular maze-like structures. They will do computation. Um, the way you get them to move is that, again, like the slime mold, you use light and shadow uh, because the crabs are scared of predatory birds. And so by passing shadows over them, you can set them off down their little path and, uh, and build a crab computer. You can even make a computer out of a bucket of water. Uh, what, what, what can I possibly mean by that? Well, this was an experiment uh, by Spanish and German scientists that showed that uh, you could hugely improve the ability of a computer system to understand human language if instead of just encoding that language as data, you passed it through a bucket of water as ripples and then got the computer to uh, understand and look at that pattern of ripples. What seemed to be happening here is that there's a kind of translation in process from the human voice into a two-dimensional complex pattern in the water and into something that a computer can read. Um, this has something to do for me with the difference between binary and analog information, uh, between the, um, uh, the false representation of the world as being something reducible to ones and zeros, and the reality of the world as something more complex and continuous. And that when a balance is found between these things, we can understand them better. In this case, that balance is between the ones and zeros of the computer system and the continuous uh, analog nature of the bucket of water. We've, we've managed to build a computer here that is more like the world itself. And that seems to me an incredibly significant operation. So, so far I've talked about um, the extraordinary abilities of non-humans and the growing realization that intelligence exists beyond the human in all kinds of ways. And I've also talked a, lot of, a little bit about computer systems that start to either recognize the abilities of non-humans uh, and perhaps are replaced by them, or perhaps integrate them in certain ways, or perhaps um, recalibrate themselves to be more like these natural systems in certain ways. And what I'm interested in doing in the final 10, 15 minutes of this lecture is to 
try and integrate those things in some way. And to say, what would it mean for us to actually build technological systems that accounted for the world, but that also attempted to address some of the greatest problems caused by ourselves and our technologies as well. Because for certain, the, the most important task before us is to, um, is to address the damage that we're doing to the planet and find uh, more just, equal, and sustainable ways of, of living upon it. Because so much of my work has been about the dangerous effects of technology on human health, on the way that we think, on the planet itself, it's often hard to remember that there are pieces of technology that have actually helped us think better and, and to govern ourselves well in history. Um, but there are, and, and this is my probably favorite example of one. Uh, this is another thing from Greece. Uh, this is a, a fragment, the last remaining piece of something called a clerotarion. Um, it's in one of the museums in Athens, but it used to stand in the Agora, the central market of Athens in 300 BC. Uh, at the moment when what we now call democracy was invented. I have to stress always at this point that ancient Greek democracy was not magically great. Um, uh, it didn't, uh, it only included property owning men over the age of 25. Slaves, women, foreigners, many other types of people were excluded and it was not a perfect system. But it nevertheless is the system which has inspired most of our contemporary democracies for better or worse. But this is a particularly interesting object because this is a machine. It's a machine for producing what the Athenians thought was the central uh, and most important thing about democracy. Uh, and what the Athenians believed was that voting was a terrible idea. Uh, the, the thing that we tend to think of as being central to democracy today, the power to vote, the, the ancient Greeks thought was the most corrupting thing you could possibly do in a democracy. Instead, they selected people at random. This machine, uh, as I say, I used to stand in the middle of the Agora, uh, as high as, six foot high, as high as a person, um, and it had these little metal slots on the front of it. And when they needed uh, a magistrate or a judge or a member of parliament, or a member of a jury, because all the important officers of state were filled by this method. Um, they would gather uh, a, a, a suitably large group, and each of these people would have a small metal tag with their name on, which you can see in the bottom left of the picture, and they would insert it into the slots on the stone, and then someone would turn a handle, and, bright, and white and black balls that had filled the machine would come out at the bottom, uh, and randomly select who would be who would be chosen for these particular tasks. It's a, it's a lottery machine essentially, but a, a lottery machine that decided um, uh, who should be in charge of of um, ancient Greece. This is 300 BC. This is technology right at the heart of um, uh, of democracy, which I which I love. And, and as I said, this is a quality of democracy that we seem to have lost somewhat uh, in, the, in the many centuries since. Uh, this, this recognition by uh, randomness, by lottery. But it's something that's coming back. Um, uh, a, a form of governance that's growing in, in, um, in uh, use, in, 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 in demand as well. Uh, it's called the Citizens' Assembly. The Citizens' Assemblies are forms of governance that are formed by the random selection of people from the population. One of the most famous examples of these happened in Ireland uh, in the last five years, uh, where the Irish government decided that there were a number of problems, uh, laws around abortion, uh, what to do about climate change, how to cope with an aging population. So they thought these problems were too hard for Parliament. And so they called the Citizens' Assembly. And they selected 100 people at random from the entire population. And they put them in a hotel for a few months. And these people debated and took expert testimony and discussed the subject. And then they came up with recommendations. But what was really amazing about this process, and not just in Ireland, but almost everywhere Citizens' Assemblies have been tried, 
was that they didn't just um, come up with recommendations for government. They came to them unanimously, which in an age, as we know, that's characterized by kind of partisanship and um, division is already a huge achievement. But the 100 people from across the country, from all these different backdrops, uh, from, from, with totally different life experiences, uh, from all ages, wealths, genders, everything, that they could come together unanimously is already exciting. But they didn't just come together. They came up with solutions that were universally radical, that were far ahead of what the politicians thought were possible. Um, their solutions to climate change, the demands for a referendum on abortion, for example, which subsequently passed and changed the law in Ireland. These were things that politicians thought were unthinkable or unworkable or unpopular with the population. But a citizens' assembly made them happen. And randomness has a lot to do with that because it's, um, it's based on a principle called uh, cognitive diversity. And cognitive diversity is the realization proved by things like the citizens' assembly and also backed up by all kinds of sociological research and mathematics that the answer to complex, thorny, difficult problems, perhaps like climate change or how we address it, are best solved not by putting one very smart person in charge or even small groups of experts, but by bringing as many different kinds of thinking, as many different viewpoints as possible to bear on the subject. You don't need expert knowledge but what you do need is many, many different kinds of knowledge. This is the realization for the citizens' assembly and even perhaps what the ancient Greeks were onto as well. And that for me is, is the kind of main huge realization uh, that I've been slowly coming to over time in thinking about how we need to rethink our technology uh, and our politics, but also our, our relationship to the world. Because if the world is full of non-human intelligences of all and marvelous and diverse kinds that we're only just starting to realize have been there all along, and if the best way to um, address and consider and act upon the most complex problems that face us is to bring as many different kinds of intelligence to bear upon the questions in front of us, then it seems obvious to me that the next phase for our societies, for humanity, and for the planet is to bring the intelligences of non-human beings into discussion and debate and political action alongside us in ways that we're you know, ways we possibly can't even imagine at present, but are incredibly urgent for us to work upon. The future demands that we uh, speak with and recognize uh, the vitality of all non-living beings and trust to their intelligence as well as ours in order to find um, shared solutions for the future of the planet. I'm going to stop there. Um, because I've gone a little bit over time, but I think that makes a good place to end. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, and I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, James. It's been a really wonderful way of crossing all interdisciplinary subjects, and you've brought very specific um, examples and, and logic and all of those different examples, and with really stunning visuals. And so that really um, calls to your sense and taste as an artist, and that's really impressive. So I would like to ask a question first. I, I actually have a lot of questions from different people. But um, I think um, uh, biological uh, computer uh, examples, the slime mold, I think um, there is an uh, artist from the UK, and she is actually working on artwork um, that has been sh showcased in Tokyo as well. Her works are really stunningly beautiful. So this kind of a biological computer-like um, computer that's different from conventional computers. 
So in order for us to share that or understand that, what are the methods we can employ in order to understand that and share that? Because with binary computers, it's just taking simple information, um, those um, cryptography and other things that uh, we share. But for these kind of biological um, computers, how can we share that? How can we um, become aware of that and understand that? So I, I know this is kind of a very big question. Um, maybe artificial intelligence could come into the picture, or maybe there could be more artistic issues uh, that come in. Data visualization could be another thing. So uh, James, could you let me know your, um, what you think about this? This is, uh, thank you very much for the question. This is absolutely the question. And this is what it kind of emerges out into at the end of this line of thought is like, what is it that we need to build in order to collaborate and create? Uh, my first part of the answer is like, I, I have this fascination with kind of biological or unconventional computing because I have this particular technological computing background. But the computer part is only a metaphor or a model. It's really important to remember that slime molds or other things, they're not computers, right? So they may be capable of doing certain types of calculations, as we saw, like the kind of like rail maps or these certain kind of mathematical problems. But um, that, that's the only, you know, those are the few things we've managed to figure out that they can do. But they are beings with their own interests and their own forms of intelligence. And I think this will get really, really interesting when we figure out how to treat these creatures as being kind of research colleagues rather than as computers. And I think that's true as just as much for artificial intelligence. Um, in my own work, you know, I, I've, seen a, I, I've seen very different results when I've used artificial intelligence as a tool as a piece of mathematics, and when I've treated it as something a bit more like a colleague or a, a kind of co-creator. For myself, um, I'm at the moment I'm working on a new project, which is called Server Farm, um, which envisions building a complete ecosystem based on these kind of, of calculating or computing biological partners. Uh, of which slime molds may well be a part and, and other species as well. Um, I, I want to start a farm and I want to plant it with flowers that, you know, that I can read the outcome of, of computation performed by fungi and other microorganisms. I don't know what this will look like exactly yet, but I'm pretty sure it will involve this kind of mediation between humans, plants, and perhaps to machines as well all as kind of equal partners in this, this rethinking process. Thank you very much for your wonderful answer. It's really, really exciting. Um, if, you know, I could work with you as a curator for your project, that would be wonderful. Visually, um, this is a uh, really advanced and really creative, as well as the idea. A new Dark Age uh, has been translated by Professor Kubota, and Professor Kubota has some questions to you. And I'd like to read it out. Non-human intelligence and being, that has to be fully understood rather than um, understanding them as a kind of mimics of uh, human beings, uh, we should be able to understand their intelligence and being as is. And for that, what kind of method or metaphor could be available? Yeah, I mean, this is exactly correct. It's, as I've said, it's our greatest mistake is to kind of try and understand non-human intelligence as though it's human intelligence, and, and we do that with so many other things as well. Um, but for me, the, the model of metaphor is, is pretty simple. It's, it's, it's really just recognizing that and taking the time and listening and paying attention. Um, a good example of this comes from, uh, from, from kind of uh, animal research, biological research. Um, 
one of my favorite uh, researchers is someone who spent many, many, many years um, with uh, bamboo, uh, bamboo I'm sorry. Uh, with, uh, I'm sorry, I'm totally blanking on the name and I'm just going to find her name quickly. Um, uh, uh, Barbara Sp Smuts is her name, my apologies. Um, Barbara Smuts. So she was a researcher who spent a huge amount of time uh, working with um, with apes uh, of various kinds, uh, and what she discovered was that as an animal researcher, she was trained to um, to basically not make herself visible to the animals. So she would be shadowing uh, a, a kind of troop of of baboons, um, but if they noticed her, she was always told she should sort of back away. Uh, and not disturb them because then they change her their behaviour, and um, and not uh, and then you wouldn't understand how animals really behave. But what Barbara Smut started to do over time was she started to not retreat. In fact, she started to respond, learning from the baboons how to respond to them. And she realised, for example, that if she gave a little sort of grunting noise when they grunted at her. It was basically a noise that said, everything's fine. And they allowed her to stay with them. And the longer she stayed with them, the more she understood about them. Um, and in fact, she discovered all kinds of extraordinary things over 20 years of studying, studying these baboons. And the way she did it was that she made herself, not necessarily a friend, but certainly a, a good neighbor, as someone who was not seen as a threat, as someone who was frankly polite, because what would be weirder than a researcher kind of coming up to you and then pretending you're not there while quite obviously watching you? And I really love this, this, this idea of like a, a kind of slow approach to a subject, but that acknowledges that we share space, that we share a world, and that we even share a lot more communication than we realized. We have many, many ways of communicating with non-human species. Baboons might be a bit easier than slime molds, but we share a world and we can figure out how best to approach one another and treat each other with respect and thus to learn more from one another. Hi. Thank you for that. You know, you really use really vivid, exciting words, and that really helps to inspire images of what you're talking about. The next question is from a student, and the original uh, question was in um, English. So I'm going to be reading out in Japanese, but the translator will read out the original English. So capitalism is really um, accelerating, and so um, technology applications uh, have a lot of possibility at the moment. So I'd like to ask about the factor of specificism in the possible application of technology, partially in the instrumentalization of things, beings in the last acceleration of rampant late capitalism, how to avoid colonial domination in thinking with other beings and their alternative intelligences. I mean, the answer is we have to avoid it. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think I understood you asked, in particular, talking about something like speciesism. Um, it's it's very obvious that uh, not just capitalism, though capitalism obviously reinforces this and accelerates it. Um, but one of our kind of great handicaps to advancing as a species, but also as surviving is our, our intention of dominating all other species, um, of considering ourselves to be the, the only important ones. And that is, as I think the question implied, a continuation of the same racist, sexist, colonial logics that we've been stuck in for a very, very long time. Um, but at the same time, it's largely true that all improvements in the kind of human collective lot have uh, been improved by the more people we consider to be real in any meaningful way. And 
the challenge to us now is to extend that respect and realness to other species in very clear, meaningful ways. And there is a growing kind of body of political theory around this, of legal theory. And I think there's, very, there's a number of interesting ways that that could unfold. Uh, for example, there's something in the United States called the, um, uh, the Non-Human Rights Project, uh, which files legal cases to try and free um, animals from zoos um, by invoking uh, the law of habeas corpus, uh, which basically is the law which says, um, which, which, which prevents unlawful imprisonment. Um, but if the trick is that if habeas corpus is invoked, it implies that the person to whom it applies is a person, right? And therefore has rights under the law. And so if a judge says, uh, allows like, habeas corpus to be applied to an elephant or a chimpanzee, it transforms the elephant or chimpanzee into a, a creature with, with rights in front of the law, which at present only most or some humans have. So that's a kind of legal approach to it. Though it's happening in other places in more interesting ways. Uh, in India, for example, many states have declared that actually animals and also ecosystems already have these rights. Uh, in New Zealand, famously, quite recently, a river was granted legal personhood. And, and the, the meaning of this is that um, before, essentially, if you wanted to, say, protect a river uh, from something, from environmental damage, you had to prove that the damage would end up with humans because we're the only ones who matter, right? But because the river was given legal personhood, you only have to prove that the river itself is being damaged, which totally changes the game and gives that river a similar kind of importance uh, to humankind. Um, so the, these are really fascinating. I don't think they go nearly far enough. I don't think that a human law, a law that's founded on human exceptionalism will ever really change itself sufficiently to fully include the rights of non-humans, however much we would like to. But it's an interesting road to go down. Um, I, think, I think really the, the, it, it requires a much deeper change in consciousness and a much deeper relationship to non-human beings that's very, very difficult to imagine and probably even harder to practice. Um, but, but, it's, but it's there. I mean, it's, it's something that I've increasingly, you know, come to understand and experience by kind of studying these things and writing about them. It has changed my relationship to the world in really deeply fundamental ways. And so that changes consciousness is possible. But like, the end of capitalism, it remains quite hard to imagine, but that's what we're all here to do. Thank you. Going to the next question. And um, this is um, a quite philosophical. In Asia, uh, we have kind of um, animism, which means that, that we believe that spirit is there in everything. Um, every living or non-living uh, has a spirit. So what do you think about the difference between Western and Eastern ways of thinking in terms of understanding different forms of intelligence? Uh, do you think there is a difference between the West and the East in terms of how un to understand intelligence? Um, yes, there absolutely is. And my knowledge, I'm afraid, is woefully limited regarding non-Western traditions. So I, I try to keep space for them and, uh, and, and recognize how little it is that I know. Um, I mean, animism provided the background to all European and American thinking about this over time. Uh, and and, we've, and we've, we broke with it. We broke with it quite deliberately through the teaching of people like Descartes, for example, who believed that animals were just machines with no thoughts and feelings. And he has a lot to answer for. Uh, um, but I, um, there's a couple of things. There is a, a kind of resurgence of animism, a reinterest in the West, 
a, a serious one, I think, uh, through that, that's kind of fight, trying to find a way out of some of the constrictions of Western philosophy through mm -hmm. things like object oriented philosophy um, or, or just you know, under the banner of uh, kind of neo animism itself. Uh, that's realized that Western philosophy has found itself in a bit of a dead end with regard to non-human species and also to non-human things. Um, I'm fascinated by, you know, not just these questions of, of how do we acknowledge the, the, the living and being of non-human animals, but also things like machines. Um, what is it that makes us capable of considering the soul or being of, 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 of machines as well as animals? And I, I think animistic thinking probably contains quite a lot of interesting thoughts about this. But with regards to the East versus the West, I'm, I'm not sure that's the def defining line either, because I'm wary of saying that animistic thinking magically makes any of this much better. Um, there's, there's not much less of a history of violence towards non-human animals uh, in any part of the world based on its belief. This feels like a thing that the whole species really has quite in common and really needs to kind of relearn its way out of one way or another. Um, so I think it's important to note that it's not just a not just a dividing line problem either. Oh, neo animism or new animism is a word that is um, often said and in the artwork and an art world and curating world a lot of curators talk about that also so the next question is a more practical question and it is from a student with the impact of covid um, people are relying more and more on the internet and so um, we're creating a lot of artwork online and also exhibiting online and so through the online exhibiting and publishing People's uh, will people's um, perspective of view of artwork um, become expanded, or what are the differences that you see? What are the potential that you see for showcasing artwork in, on online as opposed to the real space? Um, I mean, I've worked in digital arts for a long time, and I'm a huge fan of um, digital work in general, particularly work that's critical within that space. Um, and it has been really, really interesting to see the ways in which COVID has, has pushed that to some extent. But I confess that mostly it's been hugely disappointing. Um, mostly it has been taking work that exists in the world and putting it in little boxes onto screens, um, which is not really great. Um, uh, and I kind of really want this era of tiny boxes on screens <laughs> to be over as soon as possible. Um, I, I think that there are really interesting things to be done digitally online at present. But I also, I, I, I would have said this before COVID, but I think it's almost even more true because we're also stuck inside this machine at the moment. These works really need to address the kind of conditions under which they're produced and the systems through which they're distributed. Um, because what I don't see enough of is artists reimagining the ways in which to present such work online. You know, of course, we know it's easy to share video or simple images or so on and so forth online. But I, I would like to see more examples of like actually rethinking how that work is shared and experienced that this should as you say be a really great opportunity for i i, I will give a couple of examples of that because otherwise that just sounds really like i'm an old man moaning um uh for example i personally try and use um a lot of distributed systems when i when i use my work uh, an example of, for that would be even something like video chat like this to use something like Jitsi rather than Zoom. These are just competitors, but the difference is Jitsi is a peer-to-peer -peer system, which means that you and I were speaking to one another 
directly over that system, we would be speaking directly, not through the servers of a large company, right? And we're redistributing information, but we're also redistributing power within the system. And all of us have the capability to do that, depending on the tools we use. Um, that's that's my kind of first point, that the choice of tools is really important. Second one is we build our own. Um, a good example for this is my friend, Constant Dulat, who's an amazing uh, digital artist, among other things, who's, uh, who built a project, project during COVID called Common Garden. I'm pretty sure it's called that. It might be at common.garden, but have a search. Um, and common.garden is a new interface for experiencing art events, art exhibitions, that is unlike a video chat and is unlike a physical gallery that is genuinely feels like something weird and new. And so I, that, that's the things that I think are super interesting is when artists get involved in the kind of tool making um, to create the kind of spaces and experiences for art ourselves that are also capable of us producing new art forms and art experiences as well. I'm going to just check that link and put it in the chat if I can. So artists are creating their own tools. I think uh, literacy is one thing, or being able to do programming. So engineering as well as uh, uh, the humanities, uh, you cut across different um, disciplines and have uh, uh, skills and also educational processes that cut across different disciplines. I think these are something that are desperately needed. The next thing is about uh, life and uh, intelligence. Uh, the question goes, a lot of uh, what you've talked about is also something to do with a life, artificial life or a life. And I think uh, in the area of a life, I think the purpose of this discipline is to find life beyond existing life. And then in such a field, intelligence is considered to be a byproduct of life. Is there uh, any ideas that you would like to talk about uh, in this field of a life? Yeah, a life, artificial life is a huge field that I've read a little bit about, um, but I'm certainly no, not wildly knowledgeable about. But I, I think there's really interesting, my understanding is there's very interesting stuff going on there. Um, what I the th the things that I would have to say about it are that for me it's it's probably I hope it's something a bit similar to artificial intelligence in the sense that by creating these things we come to an awareness of the greater number of possibilities that exist in the world already for life that we start to see all the different forms of life or ways of living that exist um, and perhaps and i don't know enough about this though i don't see why it should be impossible that a life will create beings of some form that are uh that, that are that, that are that, that are that exist that, that that have their own meaning and life and being and so forth um, but i guess the reason i haven't investigated it too much is because it doesn't feel as if it's something that happens in the world. Um, that it seems a, it seems an abstraction um, in a in a in a different way to artificial intelligence. Uh, if I'm understanding the terms correctly, that um, that I'm interested in forms of life that are that that are kind of rooted and returned into the world. Um, well, I don't know. I may be talking in circles. Uh, I, 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 will, I, I would like to know about the forms of a life that yeah, allow us to regard the world itself as being uh, something more interesting and accessible rather than being kind of wholly thought experiments. But even as I say that, I realize that would be due to artificial intelligence and I've already busted that myth, I hope. So, so, so I shall go and discover more. Thank you very much for that. So, 
earlier, the 2011 uh, the new aesthetic, which has been uh, launched in um, on Tumblr from 2011, um, the project which you launched, I, I think that poses a kind of an antithesis to the universalized digital society. So going forward in the internet, um, do you think local webs and uh, individuals' blogs um, would get power, and what kind of power uh, would they have, and how would they change in future, or how should it change in future? Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're in a weird time of kind of, I think of it as the kind of like, um, uh, the, the, I mean, it's the sort of centralization, the kind of post, um, post reformation or counter reformation time of the internet, when most of what made it incredibly generative in its early days, which were, as you point out, the kind of proliferation of um, kind of independence and individual projects, a cognitive diversity, one might say, has largely been replaced by a kind of corporate monoculture in a process that we really should be familiar with by now. Um, but I think the, but for me, that, that, that kind of revolutionary potential of the web, or the internet in general, entirely remains. Um, through kind of distributed and uh, decentralized projects and, and kind of weird new forms. And I mean, that's, that's the only place it's going to come from, right? Like it's only going to come by people making kind of weird and interesting things once again, finding not new, just new things to say, but new kind of protocols in order to, to make that happen. Um, I, I think I'm sorry, we're going to end up saying the same kind of thing as I said about, about digital art, because I think they're intensely related. Um, like new advances in, in ways of thinking and seeing and being, <laughs> they come from forging new types of connections between many, many people who are starting to see similar kind of things. Um, what happened with the new aesthetic, which was mentioned, is that really I, I think this is what happened because the whole thing was very bizarre. But um, basically, I, I, I gave a name to something that a lot of people had already recognized in various forms. Uh, I kind of, you know, put a convenient label on, on a number of things that could then be talked about together. Um, and that's often all it takes. But I, you know, that, that approach definitely came out of the culture of early blogging, of which I was a part. And the internet, when I first came to it, the internet I spent a lot of time on a long time ago, was entirely composed of kind of internet uh, individual sites. But that spoke very often in these kind of collective voices, um, or at least collectively around subjects in really interesting ways. Um, I think that's entirely possible now, and I think we, we, we will keep seeing it. Um, but of course, it matters like what we choose to talk about. And for me, uh, for the last decade, that was largely digital culture, at least the relationship between digital culture and wider human culture, and particularly kind of political and social issues. But I think for the next decade, for me, it's, it's more the relationship between the internet and technology and ecological issues and how those impact the human, but also the more than human, um, you know, uh, political and social issues. What we choose to pay attention to matters intensely. Um, and if the current kind of counter reformation of the web largely seems to be one in which our attention is, is controlled, by large companies, which it is, then some way of breaking out of that in order to be able to redefine and redirect our attention definitely seems necessary. Hi. Thank you very much, James. Um, we are actually running out of time, although there is a lot more people who would like to ask questions, but uh, we will have to close your lecture part as well as the QA part. 
So you cut across uh, two disciplines. Yes. I just uh, I wanted to answer one more question, which I've seen in the Q and A. Um, is that okay? Very quickly. Hi, Yes, please, please, please. Um, there was someone in the Q and A asked what science fiction might be appropriate to thinking about this, and that's one of my favourite things. So I wanted to give quickly uh, a couple of examples. Uh, a book that's been incredibly important to thinking my most recent thoughts is the science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson's most recent work, The Ministry of the Future. This is an incredibly powerful work that explores what we could practically do in the coming decades to address climate change. Um, a second book that I return to frequently is Adrian Tchaikovsky's Children of Time series, which places octopuses and spiders and other creatures uh, on the same level as humans when we're doing space exploration, which is brilliant. And the third person who comes above all others uh, is Ursula Le Guin, uh, who should be read in full by everyone compulsively, read all of it uh, politically, socially, economically, and in our relationships to more than humans. Ursula Le Guin, God rest her soul, should be mile high statues around the planet and we should be following everything she does. So thank you. I just wanted to answer that question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that very interesting selection of uh, recommended books. So once again, uh, James, thank you very much. Um, against the backdrop, backdrop of the current situation as an artist, as a researcher, uh, how to analyze what is going on right now and uh, new proposals and a lot of uh, new ideas, really suggestive. Thank you very much. A new book of uh, uh, James is going to come around in spring. So once it's published, uh, please um, take it and uh, read it. Final comments, James. Hi, uh, just to say thank you very, very much for listening. This is an ongoing conversation and it's an it's a honor to have an opportunity to kind of think through some of these questions with you. Thank you very much for that session. And with that, we end the lecture and session. And thank you very much to the members of the audience also for attending.